I want to tell you a little bit about this. This is a happy story. I don't know how many of you have seen this on the news, but this is an incredibly happy story, and the only reason this is a happy story is because of well-designed systems by, through process re-engineering and well-trained people. Let me tell you a little bit about the story. This, is, this happened last week in New York. Plane took off from LaGuardia Airport, if any of you have been there. It was up at about 3,000 feet and hit two flocks of birds. What's the likelihood of hitting two flocks of birds? Well, a plane in the U.S. with all the tens of thousands of planes that take off, a plane hits birds about almost 500 times a year, which is pretty small. And all of these planes fly on one engine. So when they hit a bird and it ruins the engine, they can usually land at a local airport and everybody's fine. This is an incredibly freak accident. The two flocks of birds hit both engines, and at 3,000 feet, the plane could no longer fly. So, what happened? Well, the people in the cockpit, as well as the flight attendants, were incredibly well trained, and they had processes to follow. The person flying the plane initially was the co pilot. When in the US in the news, you hear a lot about the pilot of this aircraft, it was the co pilot. When it, helped hit, when it hit 3,000 feet and, it hit the, and it, the planes were, excuse me, the engines were, went out, the plane becomes a glider. At that exact moment, the co captain said to the co pilot, I have, the, I have the aircraft. And the co pilot said back to him, You have the aircraft. Sounds simple, right? You do that type of stuff in a surgical suite, which doesn't happen, there'd be a lot less errors. They, don't, they did that. That meant the pilot was flying the plane. What was the co-pilot doing? Does anybody know? Co-pilot immediately opened the manual and said, I'm going to look at the checklist. How do I restart the engines? There was no panic. There was no worry. Everybody knew exactly what they had to do. And through this process, through these well-designed systems, they were able to actually land the plane. There's a little bit more story to this. It's all about teamwork. The plane was so well designed that even without the engines working, this little propeller drops from the bottom of the aircraft and generates electricity to be able to use the flaps and to fly the actual plane. And planes fly as a glider. The pilot decided to land it in the Hudson River. Why? Because he didn't want, wasn't sure if he could land the plane back at any of the nearby airports. He also knew that there would probably be boats around who could save them. So this is the first ferry that actually reached this plane. And guess what they did? They had teamwork, because you know what they practiced? Man overboard drills. And they showed up, and they knew exactly what to do in getting all those people. So in that aircraft, it's a great story. There were 155 people on the airplane, and all 155 people lived. There was only one serious injury. One of the flight attendants hurt her leg. Otherwise, some of these people actually walked off with their clothes and just kind of went back home. And the only reason this happened was because of teamwork and good processes. Every system is perfectly designed to achieve exactly the results it gets. Don Berwick, who is um, a guru in health, in health IT and patient safety. If you do not change your processes, if they had not practiced what they had did on that aircraft, if you, not, if you don't practice what you're going to do in your hospital and utilize your health IT and redo your processes, you're just going to keep getting the same results over and over again. So you need to change your processes. Successful use of HIT is you have to develop good plans, convince people that change is needed and why, include all the stakeholders, invest in the governance and planning and the committees that you need, make sure the physicians are serviced and what's important to them, with, and make sure the patients are actually to service, recognize and design and use reports, Make sure you have balanced scorecards to measure what you've done and how you're doing so you can continually improve. That's a classic part of Six Sigma and important. Transfer, use the data and information that you collect. Make sure it meets your, your strategic vision and revising your process. Monitor what you're doing and recognize what you have to innovate. I'll leave you with this African proverb. Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. He knows it must run faster. And the fastest lion will be killed. Every morning a lion wakes up. You know, it knows it's outrun the slowest gazelle, it will start to death. It doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle, when the sun comes up, you better start running.
Thank you. Any questions? Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, as hymns, and you know the focus of hymns broadens yearly and internationally. Do you see hymns actually working to come up with a set of guidelines around change management or implementation to give roadmaps to areas and opportunities where where they do need to understand the value of change management in the, in the acquisition cycle of technology? HIMSS has a variety of specialty, how should I say, <coughs> volunteer groups that work not only in the change management that Dr. Denzi talked about, uh, but in a variety of areas. We emphasize uh, change management around health IT specifically because that's where we're actually focused. Um, and we do talk, we have promoted the use of clinical decision support, for example, around the area of change management. I can talk about my, our experiences, at least internationally, in Europe and in Asia Pac. Um, in Europe, I serve as the board liaison to the HIMSS Europe Council. Um, we are just organizing that group to do some of the things that we do in the U.S. Um, through that council. Um, in Asia Pac, we, we don't have a council as of yet. We specifically just put on a presentation, uh, excuse me, a conference uh, that's going to be in Kuala Lumpur um, actually next month. Um, and we also are going to have a, we're working with a group to put on a conference in Bahrain uh, the first week of May. Um, but we're really at our infancy stage in these areas. Um, it ta it'll take some time to put together the structure to be able to work in that, uh, to work on specifically around health IT in these regions. The change management is incredibly important to HIMSS uh, because we know that you cannot have implementation, successful implementation of health IT without that type of work. Is Hetsby uh, uh, an evolution of other uh, healthcare standard initiatives like HL7, for example? Though that organization is represented at Hetsby's table. Okay. HL7 will be represented sure. at Hetsby, as other SDOs would be. So Hetsby is actually a continuation of, of, of this um, standard, right? Or it would be included within it, yes. Okay. It isn't as if HL7 is going to give up what they do. Okay. Hetsby is going to try to take HL7 standards and put it with other people's concerns around standards and other issues to make it all fit. Given even the issues working with DICOM and HL7 on IHE integrating the healthcare enterprise, that's going to be quite a challenge if you're broadening the, the number of um, people that find standards that you're working with. Yeah, uh, the, the statement was that uh, it's difficult enough with HL7 and DICOM to be able to set standards and interoperability around that, and clearly there are more standards involved in the Hitsky panel, um, so it's very, very difficult to bring these things together. Absolutely. Uh, John Halamko, who is the CIO um, at um, the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, um, is the head of the Hitsby panel, and he's done a wonderful job of bringing all of these different folks together. It is an incredibly laborious process, and he must have the patience of, uh, I, don't, I don't know, <laughs> to be able to be able to do that. Um, but you need to set these standards. It's going to be tough. It's going to be painful. You're going to have various organizations who want to be able to be have their ball and, and play with their uh, on their rules, or they're going to go away. And you can't allow that to happen because you cannot have interoperability unless you have standards, and it can't be one person's standard. I used to work for a um, vendor, and that vendor that I worked for developed their own standard that they tried to impose on their various organizations, and it was unsuccessful for them. Now, of course, they need to address the issue around CCHIT. So if you set these standards, a couple of things happen. You make it a lot easier for your vendors, too, to participate, and you can ensure levels of interoperability if you have those standards.